Hey, EXP Church fan, Pastor Mark here. Wanted to say thank you for such an exceptional Vision Sunday this past week. We have received so many encouraging messages this week, letting us know of, about the hope and the freedom and the healing that people found through the stories that we shared this past week. We believe that God is gonna use this vision of stories to not only develop our own people as they share their stories, but also reach so many people that may be going through very similar things. We believe that God is going to help so many people belong, build, and become who they were born to be through the stories that we share. Today we are in week two of our teaching series on story. And we have a real treat for you. A close friend of mine, Pastor John Tyson from Church of the City, New York, will be teaching on the topic of narrative and the stories that we find ourselves in. Pastor John is leading a great church in Hell's Kitchen, Manhattan, New York City, and they're our older brother in this movement of prayer. This is the church that we sent our team to that we talked about last week that caught the vision for revival prayer. And so let's get our notebooks ready because you're going to need them. He's a, a theologian and a master at deconstructing culture. We're going to learn so much today. So open our hearts, get our pens ready, get those tablets going and those phones, and let's just receive all that God God has for us today. Hey everybody at Experience Church, it's a joy to be with you this morning and I just wanted to take a moment just to honour and acknowledge the pastors that you have the privilege of serving under. I've known Mark and Amanda for several years now and have found them to be such kindred spirits, such a deep source of joy and such resonance between what our church is trying to do here in New York and what you guys are trying to do out there in San Francisco. So as today I preach on the topic of narrative and the importance of understanding the stories that we are in and the wars for truth at a meta level, I pray that this will equip you, serve you, and help you follow the radical way of Jesus there in San Francisco. So grace and peace to you guys. Well, welcome back, church. It's good to be together again. We are continuing our series called A Creative Minority. We're trying to ask the question, what does it mean to be the people God had in mind in a cultural moment like ours? Last week, we talked about the importance of counter-formative relationships, being surrounded by the right kind of people. We talked about the importance of being knitted and loyal to one another and how we can be a resilient community who encourage one another. And today I want to continue along by talking about how a creative minority is animated by a compelling alternative narrative. Young man grows up in a home and it's a home where he very early on he gets a sense that he wants to perform, wants to be on the stage, wants to be the center of attention, wants recognition. Spends a lot of time on social media as he grows up and begins to be exposed to more and more sort of right-wing theories about what's broken and wrong with our nation. It's obvious that America is struggling right now and everybody's looking for an explanation. He found more and more proof online and became more and more convinced that there were secret conspiracies happening behind the scenes of our public narratives. QAnon were the ones who actually understood what was happening and he gave his thoughts and his allegiance to them. And so when the president called for patriots to come to stop the steal, he put on his Viking hat, his fight club skinned clothing and was one of the people who was filmed in the middle of the Capitol building connected to the insurrection. Jake Angeli is somebody who is gonna live with the consequences of the story he believed for the rest of his life. Our stories matter. Young man grows up in Cairo, Egypt, attends the University of Cairo, graduates in 1990, and his studies are in architecture. He moves to Hamburg, Germany to attend the University of Technology. While visiting a local mosque, somehow he is radicalized and forms a terrorist cell. Muhammad Atta ends up becoming one of the masterminds behind the 9-11 attacks and flying a plane into a building because he is convinced that America is the great Satan. One person wants to save America, one person wants to destroy it. The stories we believe matter. A young woman grows up with a deep and strange sense of the presence of God in her life and a desire to use the life she has for the service of God. She goes to Ireland to study English so she can be better prepared for global missionary work. 
One day while she's on a retreat, there's a part of her order, she sees the poor and something irreparably breaks in her heart. This woman becomes Mother Teresa as we know her now and goes on to become one of the most significant figures caring about the poor and broken in our world in history. The stories we believe about how we treat those around us, they really matter. You see, all of us are deeply formed by the narratives we believe to be true. And everybody who comes to New York is following one sort of cultural script or another. Alastair McIntyre in his book, After Virtue, says this, man is essentially a storytelling animal, but a teller of stories that aspire to truth. That means I can only answer the question, what am I to do if I can answer the prior question of what story or stories do I find myself a part? And if you were to ask me what we're dealing with right now, I would say we are dealing in our nation and inside the church with a narrative crisis. The story we believe and the story we think we are a part of, what the overarching narrative of life is, determines so much. It determines what we do vocationally. It determines how we define good and evil, how we figure out what our purpose in life is, what we worship, how we make all of the major decisions of our lives, where we live, what we do with our sexuality, how we spend our money, who we vote for. Our view of all areas of life are deeply impacted by the story we perceive ourselves to be in. See, the reason that stories matter so much is because narratives determine norms. They create an overarching sense of the world that we live in. They help explain things like why we are here. It's about our origins. What's gone wrong? What's gonna fix things? How do we deal with the brokenness that we see around us? And what does that vision of salvation look like, whether it's spiritual or secular? There's a view that we're believing human history should be moving towards and we're trying to make sense of it. Stories have consequences. Narratives determine norms. And a creative minority, followers of Jesus, with this cultural posture, have to be people who get the story and narrative right. And that's what's happening in this story. That's what's happening in this passage in Luke's gospel. People are walking away from Jerusalem because they've been given a religious narrative about the kingdom of God and about God's Messiah. And it hasn't played out according to the religious script and tradition that they were given. So they're leaving. Look what it says in verse 17 as they're walking along the road to Emmaus. He asked them, this is Jesus, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? What things he asked? About Jesus of Nazareth, he replied. He was a prophet powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. And here's the verse, the, the key point of this section. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. We had hoped they had a narrative that they had believed and they had projected that narrative onto the person of Jesus. And when he did not live up to their narrative expectations, they were disillusioned and they began to walk away from his mission. Stories matter. Understanding the cultural narratives that are being given to us is one of the key tasks of discipleship in this moment. Too many of us go throughout life without consciously questioning the stories, scripts, narratives, and norms that define our individual behavior and our collective behavior. That's what they're dealing with. They had believed a narrative of a Jewish Messiah that he would be a military king. They had hoped that he would redeem Israel, but now because he was crucified by the Romans, he had failed. So where are they walking? They're walking to the village of Emmaus. What's in Emmaus? Well, historically we know Emmaus was one of the places that Judas Maccabeus, the last military leader, fought and won a decisive military victory. In fact, it's listed still to this day as one of the most important, one of the 50 most important military victories of their day. 
And so what do they do when the story they've put their hope in doesn't work out? They go back to the place where their story was last told to be true. Our narratives matter. And in our culture today, I think many people are being disillusioned with the church and disillusioned with following Jesus because we have bought into false narratives. There's so many narratives making the way in our culture. It's like we're sitting in the middle and we can no longer discern truth. So much of the conflict in the world today is based on the narratives we believe to be true. Let me just contrast two of them. Narrative number one, Christian nationalism. This says that God has a special covenant relationship with the United States of America. It was birthed in Christian glory and destiny. And there are secularists and godless people who are trying to take us away from our God-given destiny. And we must fight them off by any means necessary to maintain this undisputable fact that we are a Christian nation. Christian nationalism, that's a narrative in the world today. Narrative number two, the narrative of the African-American experience. Brought here in slavery against their will, conscripted into forced labor, a heartbreaking story of the stripping of rights, dehumanization, and a long, slow, resisted struggle against the laws and power structure of the United States. And 400 years later, Many of the people claiming the name of Jesus and Christianity are the ones most opposed to seeing a sense of racial justice in our world today. Which story is true? Do you see the point? The narrative matters. And there is conflict in the narratives that we believe in our world. And so I think if we're going to follow Jesus well, we need to reclaim the gift of discernment and be able to make sense of these dominant cultural narratives that are seeking to shape us into scripts and stories to become disciples of their larger worldview. So let's just spend a moment here unpacking a few of the narratives in our culture today. First narratives, first narrative that's out there. It's sort of like a postmodern narrative and it's defined by a suspicion of power. The summary goes something like this. The postmodern narrative is that we should be skeptical of any and all overarching narratives. Any story that contains explanatory power for all of life must be imbued with power dynamics and a vision of controlling and coercing other people. We look at what happened during World War I, then World War II, Hitler's totalitarian truth claims, the claims of communism, the claims of Christianity, that they, and they have the only religion have led to colonization and tremendous uh, abuses of people around the world. Therefore, we understand that human culture only exists and emerges through power dynamics and the exertion of will through various forms of cultural capital to establish power. And the dominant group will suppress all other groups and do anything to defend the position of power, privilege, and advantage that it holds. Hegemonic power, victim and oppressor, a struggle for authenticity and equity. That's the narrative that is pushed in our culture in many ways right now. And so if you're gonna live a story that aligns with that narrative, You have to care about justice. You must always align with the oppressed against the oppressor. You have to overthrow the powers that are exerting their will in this cultural moment, whether that be through politics, media, direct action or any any means necessary. And definition is always for and against, against the oppressor on the side of the victim. That's one of the stories right now, a postmodern suspicion of power. Another narrative that exerts huge power in our world today is the narrative of capitalism. It's purely an economic prosperity sort of a narrative. Here, private individuals have unrestrained and minimally regulated access to the capital market. They may determine where to invest, what to produce and sell, and what price they get to set the price on goods and services. Anyone can be involved, come from anywhere, and make great wealth if they understand how the market works. And so this is a a narrative. It's brought us tremendous prosperity. Capitalism's done more to alleviate people, uh, to bring people and nations out of poverty than any efforts of philanthropy in human history. And this ends up dominating our world in many ways. The free market's the best way to establish supply and demand. 
It is not perfect, but it is great. And it's invited by almost a providential invisible hand. I think about how in Aldous Huxley's book, Brave New World, the world state's based on the assembly line of Henry Ford and the Christian crosses have been, the top has been cut off to emulate the T after Ford's hallmark automobile. And the common oaths and exclamations people make are by Ford. And this is just a push for prosperity and success based on the marketplace. So the story, that if that's the narrative that's true, the story that we live into then says we've got to work, take advantage of the opportunity to participate in this market. Many other people are never given this opportunity. You've got to get an education. You've got to be upwardly mobile. And the vision is gratitude and success to live in such a great country with such opportunity. Capitalism is a dominant cultural narrative of our time. Another one, which is increasingly happening with emerging generations. It's celebrity and influence. Social media has often been identified as a scourge in our society, but it's doing better than ever. TikTok is providing an interesting glimpse and a cultural analysis of the world. There was an Atlantic article entitled 98 million TikTok followers can't be wrong. And it showed surveys of how young people have been enraptured by TikTok and media generally. And there's this narrative that anybody can become a star overnight. And so as a result, young people are attempting to get online and get as many views and likes as possible. Anybody can go from obscurity to fame. Therefore, in a recent survey from Psychology Today, they found that nearly three quarters of young people, let this sink in, want a career in online videos defined by possibly becoming a professional YouTuber. The majority of people have a narrative that says, I need to be seen, I need to be recognized, and it's possible with a cell phone and a Wi Fi connection to go from obscurity to celebrity. And so now I, I want you to imagine this if you've got a bunch of people living radically together in a house, they'd call them a cult. But you get a bunch of people living in a TikTok house, and it's just called a career. It's amazing. So the narrative, be known and recognized, build a personal brand, stand out, likes, followers, influencing, cultural attention, post, filter, guard, position, respond, pray for virality in the things that you put out. So the story, if you want to live into that, is I need to establish myself as a recognized player in my space. I need to think about how I can get attention for what it is that I'm doing. And I need to be recognized. This is one of the cultural narratives that drive our world. Do you see the narrative is the larger claim on reality and then our story is embodying through habit, practice, attention and practices how to live into that narrative. And I think a lot of folks today don't even think about the larger cultural narratives. We've been so fed on radical individualism and consumerism that we don't try and discern narratives. We just do what we do. In his book, Philosophical Investigations, Ludwig Wittgenstein wrote about what happens when we follow rules or customs, but they lack the explanatory power to help us justify what we're doing. And so he says this, how am I able to obey a rule? If this is not a question about causes, then it is about the justification for my following the rule in the way I do. If I have exhausted the justifications, I've reached bedrock and my spade is turned. Then I am inclined to say, this is simply what I do. When I run out of rational capacities to interrogate my own behavior and beliefs and I just do what I do, you end up in a place called, I don't know, America, where people aren't thinking deeply about the stories they live in or the cultural scripts or larger power claims and narratives. A lot of people are just like, these are just my preferences. I'm a consumer. This is what I do. Just like in this passive passage, their story shaped their discipleship. In our world today, much of our behavior is based on the narratives and the narrative claims that exist in our world today. Now, here's the great challenge, is that narratives are not neutral. We live in a time of narrative wars. There is contested space. There is clashing worldviews. There's tremendous manipulation. There's coercion and recruitment. 
by the various narratives to get us to believe that they're the true narrative and to villainize and tear down all other narratives. And nobody has shown us how this works more than anybody else in, he- in history to me than Edward Barnes. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with Edward Barnes, but he is the modern father of public relations. I read his biography a couple of years ago. Really, really one of the most enlightening and extraordinary books I've ever read. In 1928, he wrote a book called Propaganda. And here was his key argument, that in the United States, those who manipulate the unseen mechanisms of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of any country. Let me say that again clearly. Those who manipulate the unseen mechanisms of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of any any country. So behind the scenes, behind the politicians, behind the media, the news cycles, the legislation, the marches, there is an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of any country. This is what he wrote in 1928. And so the public, his vision was to set up public relations counselors that help corporations, governments, and individuals position themselves and manipulate society through a series of steps. So let me give you from his book the steps he says are necessary for large-scale narrative manipulation in a society. First, you must assess the product or the ideology to assure that what the client has to offer is sound. So the someone who's going to come in and help push propaganda has to make sure that what's being pushed is sound. Then they survey the sociological landscape to assess whether the ground is fertile for a given idea. Next, they formulate policies for the client to follow whenever they come into contact with the public. These policies are designed to endear the client to the public. Barnet then, and by the way, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, Edward Barnet was the nephew of Sigmund Freud. And what he did in correspondence with his uncle was he took his uncle's understanding of human psychology on an individual level and used it at mass scale to manipulate psychologically the population. Barnes then forays into the field of his uncle Sigmund Freud, writing about the phenomenon of mass psychology and propaganda. He writes, following Freud, that many of man's thoughts and actions are compensatory substitutes for desires, which he has been obligated to suppress And one way to steer people's desires is to provide the voice of an authority, a physician discussing the benefits of eating bacon, for example. And so he says, don't assault people to break down their resistance because now we're all aware of the game. If someone says, buy this now, you must have this now, there's a ton of resistance. He says, no, you've got to remove the cultural resistance. Create circumstances which swing emotional currents to remove resistance resistance. And then what will end up happening is by removing resistance, you create circumstances which will modify the customs of the group and therefore cause members to align with the ideology or purchase the product. Now, part of the amazing, part of the amending of the group though is through establishing authorities that become narrative reference points of credibility. And so in this way, the person behind the scenes maps their desires onto public figures that intersect and interest the desires of the people. Thus, the interest of the elite and powerful in some way shape the direction of the masses while they are easily reduced. And so propaganda only works when the masses opt into the narratives are provided by the invisible government. So there's a lot of manipulation to get the people to buy into the claims. So I want you to see this. Most of what you believe hasn't been arrived at through conscious thought and careful study. You've been manipulated 
by masterminds behind the scenes to believe much of what you believe. So let me give you a couple of examples. If you've ever been a teenager and you've worked in a fast food restaurant and they make you put your hair up, they put a hairnet on, that's not because somebody working in the Department of Health thought it would be a good idea. That's because Edward Barnays had the Veninda Hairnet Company as one of his clients and he manipulated restaurants and the health department to put this in so the Veninda Hairnet Company could sell more hairnets. If you've ever woken up and thought the true breakfast is bacon and eggs, that's not because that's what the true breakfast is. That's because Edward Barnays worked with bacon and egg manufacturers to push that into the American psychology as the preferred breakfast. He worked with Calvin Coolidge to just to change his stuffy image prior to the 1924 election by having a public pancake breakfast. A desperate Herbert Hoover consulted with Barnes a month before the 1932 presidential election and Barnes advised Hoover to create disunity within his opposition and present an image of himself as an invincible leader. He advised William O. Dwyer in his candidacy for mayor of New York on how to appear in front of different demographics. For example, he told, he said, you should tell Irish voters about his actions against the Italian mafia and Italian voters about his plans to reform the police department. To the Jewish community, he said, you should appear as committed as possible to oppose Nazism and the rise of fascism around the world. All of this is one man manipulating politics and health practices and handouts, but he was never more successful than with tobacco. Never more successful with tobacco. He worked to get women to smoke He said this, the first strategy was to persuade women to smoke cigarettes instead of eating. Barnes began by promoting the idea of thinness itself. One man in a desire to sell cigarettes for a company modified the body image of women differently than it had been valued at any other point in history. And he did this promoting the ideal of thinness using photographers, artists, newspapers, and magazines to promote the special beauty of thin women. And he ended up working with one of his clients, which was the Lucky Strike Cigarette Company. And one of the biggest problems they had is that the packaging had an awful color of green that women were particularly opposed to. They didn't perceive it to be feminine whatsoever. So what did he do? He set up in 1934 something called the Green Ball. And what he did with the Green Ball was he began to take the color of the Lucky Strike cigarette packaging and then get it pushed through major media. He had a ball where celebrities attended and they actually deemed the color green separated but consciously manipulated the color of Lucky Strike cigarettes, as the color of the year. And so greenness itself took on an entire cultural cachet amongst the elites because Edward Barnet's behind the scenes was trying to sell cigarettes to the mashes. I could go on and I could go on. Here's the point I'm wanting you to see. Most of the narratives we think we have freely chosen are just large forms of manipulation. Now, at this point you're like, John, that's actually pretty insightful, but it sounds like to me that you are feeding conspiracy theory thinking. Isn't this level of suspicion of cultural narratives how people buy into crazy cultural theories? It could be. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to help you realize that we do not live in neutral space and that everybody and everything has an agenda and people are using whatever cultural tools and power they have to facilitate that agenda. And so as followers of Jesus, we need the gift of discernment to make sure that our faith is not being corrupted and co-opted or disproportionately influenced in ungodly ways by the war of narratives happening around us. This is a time to reclaim biblical truth. And so a creative minority is aware of the power of narratives. They realize we live in a time of narrative warfare. And so they are committed to live by a compelling alternative narrative, which is the story of Jesus, the story of his kingdom and the way of Jesus. So I want to articulate this just a touch more. Narrative versus story and how we follow Jesus in a compelling manner in this time. 
Narrative is the overarching vision of ultimate reality. It's the power claim. It's the truth claim. And story is the small embodiment of those narrative values that make the narrative plausible and possible. See this, truth claim. Story is aligning the individual story with the larger narrative claim. So cultural change then happens not by random individual stories of authenticity, but by narrative shifts and claims backed up by carefully crafted stories. Let me say that one more time. Cultural change happens not by individual random stories, but by narrative shifts and claims that are then backed up by carefully crafted stories. And this is where the Overton window comes in for bending cultural narratives. The Overton window is actually a theory of political change that asks the question, how does something that seems absolutely radical and impossible move into the point of legislation? And it's a window of how psychologically people move over time to change their entire opinion of something. So you could go through history and ask the question, how has society changed its ideas? And you will see that very carefully, people have introduced and followed the Overton window to make this happen. So I think maybe the clearest example that we can all witness in our midst is how the LGBTQ community have utilized the Overton window over the last 40 years to fundamentally transform the entire society's perception of sexual minorities and their place in our society. So if you go and actually look at how this happens, you look at how same-sex relationships were viewed perhaps in the 1970s and 80s, particularly around the AIDS crisis, to the point where the Supreme Court looks into the Constitution and says same-sex marriage is a legitimate constitutional right of the United States. If you were to ask a generation in the 80s, do you see a day this ever happens? People would have said, never. But they changed the narrative from same-sex relationships as sin to love is love. And then individual stories are carefully crafted and put into various cultural mechanisms to readjust our thinking to the narrative that love is love. Map onto that a desire for justice and you see one of the largest cultural shifts around sexuality recorded in history. Now, some of you are like, why are you pointing that out? I'm just pointing it out as an example of how a narrative claim backed up by stories, then taking the Overton window, a process of introducing and reinforcing through those stories actually leads to change. And here's the argument I'm wanting to make, that as followers of Jesus today, we have to, in the midst of all of these narrative wars, get our narrative right about Jesus. And then we personally have to embody that in compelling and careful ways to move our current cultural narrative away from its dynamics to one that seems absolutely impossible. And what is that narrative? Here's the narrative that Jesus is Lord. That is an impossible cultural narrative right now, that Jesus Christ is Lord. But that's the narrative that we are called to be a part of. We have to take whatever thinking we have in any area of life, we have to root it and route it through the person of Jesus. This is what happens in this passage. Have a look in verse 25. He said to them, this is Jesus, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And here's the key verse, verse 27. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And this is the narrative claim we have to have right now. Everything that we do as followers of Jesus has to be about Jesus Not American politics, not American nationalism, not morality for its own sake, not our own personal projects, not a commitment to financial prosperity, not a commitment to Christian celebrity. One thing, everything has to be about the person of Jesus. So the narrative has to be Jesus is Lord and then you and I have to live stories that are so compelling that they align ourselves with that history-shaping narrative claim. 
in a compelling way that shows that the gospel is in fact good news. The narrative, Jesus is Lord. My story, your story, we are kingdom disciples. Our vision in, in a way that seems completely impossible, like the Overton window, we insist that the gospel is good news and we live it in a compelling way at this time of history. Narrative, story, shift. Creative minority at this time of history has to be aware of those dynamics, commit to a compelling alternative narrative in the midst of the narrative wars, and then embody that story so compelling that it shakes our world from its spiritual sleep. So what are the implications for this? Well, I think number one, I wanna say this. We as a church and as followers of Jesus, we need to go through a deep time of narrative examination. What are the ultimate claims that I am believing about life? Because they will, they will shape the decisions I'm living in. Look at what the disciples did. It says, when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were open and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? So they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 with them, assembled together and said, it is true, the Lord has risen and appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. This is what happened to them. They had one narrative about religious tradition. And there was many of their day. There was the Pharisees who had a holiness narrative. The Essenes had a separation narrative. The Zealots had a violent narrative. The Sadducees had a sort of concession narrative. And yet Jesus comes along and gives them a kingdom narrative. And this kingdom narrative transforms their life. All of their expectations were routed through the person of Jesus. He retold their story with a Jesus-centered lens. And then it sent them back into a different narrative, living a different story. And so I think this is one of the things we have to do. We have to get the Jesus-centered story right. Replacing one bad narrative for another bad narrative is not the solution. Fighting over secular ideology with non-Christian ideology is not helping our discipleship. We have to learn to discern between common grace, distortion, agenda, and kingdom vision. And we have to be people who view everything. Our lens has to be an explicit Jesus-centered narrative. Jesus is Lord as his self-denying disciple. Everything I do will be to embody that narrative in a compelling way and shift our culture's understanding towards the kingdom of God, not through coercion or through violence, but through love and a compelling alternative story. So this to me is a time for all of us in 2021 of deep examination. So I want to encourage you firstly to look at your own personal story. How Jesus centered is your story? Is this your narrative? Is this the highest truth claim that Jesus is Lord? And then how can I be more formed deeply into the story? How I think, how I act, what I love, how is God's word shaping my understanding of how I live this narrative? What in church history gives me hope for this narrative? How do I not just consume our culture, but actually analyze it and create a compelling alternative? How do I understand common grace, distortion, propaganda, and agenda? We have to be people of the gospels and of God's word. And I want to call us to re-examine the scripts in our hearts and the narratives that we may have been seduced by and make sure that this is the narrative over our lives. Jesus is Lord. My story is about discipleship and I will push in a narrative war, but one of love and compassion against the ones of our age to make Jesus compelling and beautiful. Look at what it says in Hebrews 5. There is so much more we'd like to say about this, but it's difficult to explain especially since you're spiritually dull, you don't seem to listen. You've been believing so long now that you ought to be teaching others. Instead, you need someone to teach you again the basic things about God's Word. 
You're like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. Listen to what he says. For someone who lives on milk is still an infant and doesn't know how to do what is right. Solid food is for those who are mature and through who training have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. So I want to call you to hunger for solid food, to become mature and who have the skill to recognize narrative manipulations and wars because you're devoted to letting the Word of God change the scripts of your heart and make that narrative the most compelling narrative of your life. Secondly, as followers of Jesus living as a Christian community, we need to get our story right. We need to be committed to being salt Light. We need to commit to being united. We need to speak truth to one another. There needs to be a sense of potency in all we do. And that's why we preached on the Beatitudes in the midst of all the cultural crisis. Because Jesus says we're called to give light to the house. And our narrative has to be a narrative that stands out for how holistic it is, how beautiful it is, how just it is, and how compassionate it is. And that comes when we take the teachings of Jesus and we model those in community. Look, in a church like ours, we've got people from various backgrounds, various cultural traditions, various political traditions, and every other tradition and story has to submit and bow to the true story of the story of Jesus if we are going to be a united people like God calls us to in this time. We need to have the courage to confront each other when our cultural stories are blocking the kingdom story. And we need to have the humility to learn and understand that we, we need one another to point out those blind spots. So we need to examine the narrative, uh, how our own narratives are impacting our church narrative. And then lastly, I wanna say this. We need to understand that in a time of narrative wars with such potency like our world today, we need to be patient, we need to be willing to be misunderstood and we need to be willing to suffer. Because the early church brought the Roman Empire to its knees, not through political power or military might. They brought it to its knees through suffering love. And it took not one generation or two generations, but 300 years. Alan Crider says this, religion must be defended not by killing but by dying, not by violence, but by patience. And the Apostle Peter urging followers of Jesus in the Roman Empire says this, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul and live such good lives amongst the pagans, though they accuse you of doing wrong. We don't fit into their narratives. They may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Our stories have consequences. Our narratives shape our norms. We are being tossed to and fro, manipulated and coerced by various cultural narratives. May we be people formed by the Jesus narrative. And may that declaration that Jesus is Lord shape each of our stories so that over the course of time, what seemed impossible doesn't just become plausible, but it becomes beautiful and inspires our world to turn to Christ. Amen. Hi, everyone. I'm Lucia, and this is my husband, John. Hey folks. 